Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's event, which will be dedicated to statistical arbitrage in page trading. This is a second part of a series of presentation by Hudson and Thames. To start off, who we are as Hudson and Thames, if you don't know already, we are a software company. And what we do is we're building Python packages for quantitative finance. Currently, this is our products that we have, which are all Python packages. So Arbitrage Lab, MLSIN Lab, and Portfolio Lab. Two last ones, MLSIN Lab and Portfolio Lab are free to use, and you can easily use them on your machine right now by going and doing pip install MLSIN Lab or Portfolio Lab. The Arbitrage Lab is paid on a monthly basis. You can find out on our web page. Um, all these libraries, they're solving different problems and are dedicated to different uh, parts of quantitative finance. So MLSIN Lab is situated around machine learning tools. Uh, portfolio Lab includes all the tools that you might need in regards to portfolio optimization. And the Arbitrage Lab is our one of the latest libraries, and it's dedicated to statistical arbitrage and fair trading. Actually, all the presentations that are going to be today, um, so I'll start and then three researchers will continue on with the presentations. All these tools are present in the Arbitrage Lab package, so I encourage you to go and check it out. We are also, as Hudson and Thames, running the apprenticeship program. Actually, just now we've finished the present cohort of uh, apprenticeship students. Um, they are three, three students that joined us as researchers. Um, why would you be interested in this? Well, because you'll be going through the process of analyzing literature, building ideas from scratch, making it in a form of production level code, writing documentation, supporting blog posts, supporting notebooks, and doing presentations such as what we're going to be doing today. Um, this is a online full program that is about two to three months long, and it includes all the stages of software development that we do in Hudson and Temp, starting from literature analysis and prototype building, finishing up by releasing a production level code that is really high graded. What is the plan for today's event? So we are presenting you this five separate presentations today. Each one will take approximately 25 to 30 minutes. And after them, there'll be five minutes dedicated sections for questions and answers. I ask you to please keep your questions till the end of each presentation, not to interrupt the speakers. If you didn't see already our previous presentation series, we had the following presentations there. So uh, distance approach, co-integration approach, uh, basic copula strategy, and machine learning for pair selection. If you didn't check them out, they're on our YouTube channel, and by now they should be uploaded there. So we encourage you to go and check them. And there also should be links with the slides for those presentations if you'd like to study them more carefully. But the plan for today is, first, I'll present you with the PCA approach in pair trading. Then I'll give the word to Hansen, who will present first uh, variations in the mispricing index trading strategy, which is an addition to his previous presentation on basic couple strategy. And he will also present the introduction to Vine Copula, which is a great concept, and I really encourage you to have a look at it. Then we'll have a 10 minute break because this session is going to be quite long, so you would have some rest. Next, after the break, there will be a presentation by Yi Feng on identifying sparse mean reverting portfolios. And finally, we'll finish with Aaron presenting on machine learning in Paris trading. So a quick word about me. My name is Ilya Barzi, and I am a quantitative research team lead at Hudson and Thames. I'm holding Master in Science in Computer Science and Econometrics from the University of Warsaw. If you'd like, if you'd have some questions regarding the presentation or you are having some longer discussion ideas that you would like to carry out outside of this event today, here is the links to my social media, so you can go follow me if you'd like to be present at our future events. Also, the slides of this presentation will likely be present under this video. Now, finally, to the topic of today's presentation, the PCA approach in pairs trading. And the plan that I'm going to be going through is as follows. So first, 
I'll give you a quick introduction so you would know what we're in general talking about, meaning PCA approach, and what is the idea of the approach. Then I'll quickly tell you about returns decomposition, following by exactly the PCA approach and how it can be used to build a trading strategy. Then we'll see some code examples and results using the arbitrage lab package. Finally, we'll discuss quickly some upsides, downsides, and the variations of the PCA approach trading strategy. And in the very end, there will be a list of references with papers that I've used to prepare this presentation. If you'd like to study them more carefully or in general, get a better understanding in the topic. So to the introduction, this presentation, as well as the module that is present in the arbitrage lab, are based on the paper Statistical Arbitrage in the US Equities Market, published in 2010 by Avalaneda and written by Avalaneda and Lee. Um, what was the idea there? So first, the idea was to decompose stock returns, then create eigenportfolios, model the residuals as mean reverting processes, and finally generate trading signals out of them. What were the results? Um, Authors show that the PCA strategy had an annualized Sharpe ratio of 1.44 from 97 to 2007, which is quite nice taking into account that they took um, transaction cost and slippage into account calculating this. However, the better part of the Sharpe ratios were observed before year 2003. First, now let's go to returns decomposition. Let me introduce you to the concept of idiosyncratic components. So say we have a series of stocks and we have N of those stocks and we can see returns of stocks. Well, the returns of those stocks can be decomposed as following in the part which would be systematic component and the idiosyncratic component, uncorrelated idiosyncratic component, basically regressing one thing on the other. Um, this factor cannot be one, as you can see in the first formula here, um, but there can be actually M systematic factors, and you can decompose these returns into M systematic factors plus the idiosyncratic component. And this component will be unrelated to these factors. Um, here you can see that F is a return of a market portfolio or a factor in the case of the second um, formula here. What this can be for a market portfolio, this can be a S&P 500, for example, or something representing the market itself. Uh, for systematic factor, it can be, say, sector ETF or some other division of market into different smaller pieces. Next, we can define the idea of a market neutral portfolio. And it can be obtained if we would invest amounts Q from QI from one to N invested in each stocks as follows. Why is it interesting? Well, because as shown in the paper by Avalanada and Lee, the market neutral portfolio is only affected by idiosyncratic returns. So we're having a portfolio that is not directly related to market moves, but rather related to this uncorrelated moves uh, of the market and of the well of the stocks actually. It is also shown based actually on the research and timeframes used by researchers that in G8 economy, stock returns can be explained by approximately 15 factors or in general between 10 and 20, maybe 30, depending on exact stock and uh, market and time period taken. What this means is that if we're taking only 10 to 20, 30 factors, um, this can explain more than 50% of the variation of returns, which is really good and interesting. Um, you can see, actually, if you visit the original paper, that this number of factors is changing. So even in the researcher's data set, the number of factors explaining above 50% of returns variation changes from 10 to 20 and then back to 10. So it really depends on the data set that you're taking. Now let's go to PCA approach. Um, first, how do we work with the PCA approach? We'll need a matrix of stocks returns. Uh, this formula just basically shows us that we need to have a matrix of retur daily returns in time. This can also be not daily, but the authors use daily um, returns. And this is basically looking at 
M stocks returns, M days back in history. So not the prices, but returns. What we do next? We do standardize the returns. Why? Well, because the PCA is seeking to maximize the variance of each component. And if we will put unstandardized data inside, so the data and the different variables in the data will have different variation um, bounds, uh, the output will not be uh, that good. The standardized standardization procedure is rather simple. So using these formulas here, basically taking from returns their mean value and then dividing by the historical standard deviation, we're being able to get the standardized returns as example here on the table. Next, we can build the correlation matrix from these standardized returns. And this is a standard formula for obtaining a correlation matrix. From this correlation matrix, we can get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, and we can get, well, n of them. In this case, we are ordering the eigenvalues in the decreasing order, as you can see here. And we have the corresponding eigenvectors. In this case, we can sorry, pick the number of eigenvalues and eigenvectors that we're going to be using in the PCA approach. So as you remember back in the previous slides, we had the number of factors M. So here, if we, for example, decide to keep M 15 factors, we would only take top, like biggest um, 15 eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors. If we'd like to have this uh, number varying from time to time, well, we'll be basically taking that number of eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors. Now to the creation of the eigenportfolios. For each index J, we can create the eigenportfolio, which is a set of weights. And these weights are, as you can see here, VI, which are values of, uh, well, values in the eigenvectors, divided by historical deviations that we calculated back when normalizing the data, uh, sorry, standardizing the data. And by multiplying these weights by actually returns of our stocks, we can have the eigenportfolio return. So in this way, from each eigenvector that we have, we are composing the eigenportfolio. So portfolio with weights of the eigenvector values divided by the historical uh, standard deviation. Therefore, we're getting this M, say, 15 eigenportfolios. And this is an example of actually weights that we can have to multiply them by returns and get the eigenportfolios. Why do we need all this? Well, because this 15 eigenportfolios are actually natural set of risk factors that we can use to decompose our returns. If you remember in the beginning, I showed that we can decompose each stock returns by a static component and idiosyncratic component. So in this case, these F that are factors, instead of factors, we're using the, um, sorry, eigenportfolios. And we're being able for each stock to get a modeled idiosyncratic component by taking the return value minus the sum of um, weighted eigenportfolios right here with the respective beta coefficient. So the idea here is that we're being able to get a model of the idiosyncratic components, so portfolio that is unrelated to direct market moves from each stock using this set of eigenportfolios that we've just created. And keep in mind that this is possible for each stock that we have. So say we have a universe of 100 stocks that we're taking into account. For each stock, we can have this small idiosyncratic component that we're modeling. Now, how do we like change this idea into a trading strategy? Um, I'm omitting some of the math here, actually. And I, if you'd like to have a deeper understanding of what's going on, encourage you to look at the original paper. But basically, what we do is Remember, we have these idiosyncratic components that we're modeling that are unrelated to general market moves. Well, we can write them down using these models here. First, the idiosyncratic component can be decomposed into a drift parameter right here, alpha dt, and another part, which is dxit. And the other dxit can be written down as an Ornstein-Ullenbeck process. 
Um, here you can see some parameters. So alpha drift, K here, sigma here, and uh, M here. Values of these parameters are specific for each stock, but basically what they mean is this is a drift parameter. This is a mean reversion speed. This is the mean value. And this would be the um, variation. Um, we can assume here that all these parameters, alpha, k, m, and sigma, they are varying very slowly in relation to increments of standard Brownian, I'm sorry, Brownian motion d, w, i, t. So we're kind of assuming that they are set for each stock and throughout our observation period, they're not changing. The authors use this observation period window as 60 days, but they only make this assumption, and this is important, for the stocks, so the modeled idiosyncratic component of stocks with high mean reversion speed, K, and it's rejected for other stocks. So what this means is we're looking at all stocks modeled idiosyncratic component. We're checking if this component is actually mean reverting with good speed, which means that after it deviates from its equilibrium value, up or down, whatever, we expect it well with high mean reversion speed, so it would revert back to the equilibrium values. And we only accept this hypothesis that these parameters are constant only for those types of stocks and only for those um, modeled idiosyncratic components of such stocks. What do we do next? And this is where the well trading strategy comes in. We are calculating the S score. The S score is measuring how far away a given asset eigen portfolio is from the theoretical equilibrium associated with the model. Maybe it sounds complicated, but this only tells us, you remember that idiosyncratic component that we have, how much is it deviating from its equilibrium position, so to say. Here you can see a example of evolution of the S score for the stock GPM versus a ETF XLF of years from 2006 to 2007. And you can see that it's changing around its mean value, more or less. Um, the S score itself is calculated as, here we can see the other component of the uh, idiosyncratic component. So here, XIT, and which is being modeled as a ornstein ullendek process, minus the mean value, okay, and divided by the equilibrium volatility equilibrium standard deviation, where it's calculated as follows. For all this deeper understandings into how math works, please, I refer to the original paper. It, the link to it will be present at the end of the presentation, so you can go check how the math and what's the background be, behind all these assumptions. But what is interesting here that we can see that it's a mean revert, it looks mean reverting, and we can actually make trades based on this S score. So say if it deviates too high, we assume it to revert back to equilibrium values. And if it deviates too low, we also assume it will go back to its um, equilibrium values. Now, this is where we have the trading signals. So only if the eigen portfolio is showing a mean reversion speed above a set threshold T, we're calculating the S score. So we're looking again at all the stocks that we have taking the idiosyncratic component that we're modeling, if it shows a good mean reversion speed, we're calculating this S score to make trading signals. And the trading signals are as follows. So these S, O, S, B, S, C, whatever, these values are positive values. And based on them, we're opening either long or short positions. Let me explain this logic to you. So if S score value is below minus something, then we're opening a long position. And if it's below some positive value, we're closing a long position. So what does this mean? In this case, we saw that long position on minus something. So let's say minus one and a half. So right here, a long position will be open and will be closed in say 0 0.5. So a positive uh, value. So right here, it will be closed. The same goes for the short position. So they are opened if the S value is above some positive value, SO, and disclosed if it's just above the uh, negative value, SC. So a short position is being opened somewhere, say, one and a half right here and closed right here. So we are kind of 
taking all these deviations of the S score and expect for the idiosyncratic component or the portfolio that we're modeling to revert back to the equilibrium values here. All right, now how are the trades made? So we have this S score, but we're not trading the S score, right? What we're trading is the assets that we have in the case of this strategy and the original, it's US stocks. So opening a long position means buying $1 or one unit of the corresponding stock and then selling beta one dollars or units of assets from the first scaled eigenvector, B2 from the second eigenvector, and so on. Where does this come from? What is the logic behind it? It's really simple. We can go back to this formula right here and you're, you'll understand it perfectly. So if we're going long on the S value, which we're kind of modeling this idiosyncratic component right here. So going long means buying one unit of the corresponding stock and here you can see that we have actually this ri return with coefficient one so it's one unit of this thing plus beta multiplied by uh eigen portfolio uh returns values right here so beta one of the values in the first eigen portfolio beta two in the values of the second eigen portfolio and so and so on that's where it comes from and selling this idiosyncratic component, well, generating a sell or a short position would in this case mean going short one unit of the corresponding stock and long beta i units of the corresponding values in the eigen portfolio F respectively. Um, that's what it means. And it's basically outlined here what's the logic behind selling this. Now, as you see, there are quite some values that are being added here. So we have all these parameters as B, S, O, B, C, S, C. How do we pick them? Based on the analysis made by the original authors from 2000 to 2004 on the ETF factors. So you can, as factors, take, as I said in the beginning, not only PCA uh, portfolios, but also other things. And the authors calculated these values based on the ETF factors. So they took sector ETFs, similarly as we're talking here about the uh, eigen portfolios. And the optimal values that they found to be is opening positions for uh, buy and sell 1.25 and closing positions at 0 0.75 and 0 0.5. So how would this look, for example, for buying? This would mean that in minus 1.25, we're opening, at the plus 0 0.75 we're closing, which means that we're opening here at minus 1.25 right here, for example, and closing back here at one for, uh, 0 0.75. So as you, so you get the logic behind all this. Um, again, the strategy rationale is here to open trades when the eigen portfolio that we have is showing a, a good mean reversion speed, and only then we're calculating the S score. And if we're getting a signal from the S score strategy, then we're having a trade to be open or to close a specific trade. Uh, the logic here is we think that we detected a anomalous movement in the idiosyncratic components. And we expect most of the assets in our portfolio to be near the equilibrium value. So we're closing trades when they're close to zero. And the closing values here are close to zero, actually. Now, with all these parameters, how was the strategy used in the original example? Data set used was US stocks that had at the moment of trade a capitalization of more than $1 billion. Why? Because authors tried to avoid a survivorship bias in this way. Mm, estimation window to calculate the correlation matrix, as you remember. So we take the stocks returns and stocks M, big M, days back. We're calculating the returns for those stocks, then we're standardizing them, then we're building a correlation matrix, right? Then we're taking the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the correlation matrix, taking the top M, uh, top M small, so say 15 values of uh, eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors, dividing the eigenvector values by uh, historical standard deviation, we're getting the weights of eigen portfolios. And these eigen portfolios we're using as factors to construct the idiosyncratic component, just to refresh your mind here. So 
the estimation window for the correlation matrix is set to one year, actually 252 trading days. And the author said that there should be a balance here before between taking too long periods. So this would mean having also unrelevant information in your uh, data estimation. And too small one is not good as well because um, it's worse for the estimation of the correlation matrix. We're also going to talk about this issue later in the downsides of the strategy section. Now, estimation window for the idiosyncratic components and, well, to say if we sh if the mean reversion speed of the idiosyncratic component for a specific stock is good enough and if we should calculate the S-score and the time period based on which the S-score is calculated is taking a 60 trading days from the trade of, from the uh, trade date entry and exit points to the strategy. So as you remember, S values were taken here for all stocks, uh, entry points of 1.25 deviations from equilibrium and exit points of 0 0.5. So they were uniform across all stocks. The original paper assumed that there is a slippage and transaction cost of 0.05% for slippage and five basis points per trade for transaction costs. Um, also, as I was saying, you should keep in mind that the variance explained by the PCA eigenvalues varies through time, which can be in author's example from 10 to 30 PCA factors, which means that from 10 to 30 PCA factors are explaining 50% of the variance of the returns of a given stock. Now that we understand the strategy, let's finally go and see how it works with some code examples and results. Here you can see a quick code snippet of the code taken, well, code that is using the arbitrage.package. package. First, we're importing the packages. We're going to be using pandas, numpy, and just the arbitrage.package. package. Actually, only one class here, which is the PCA strategy. We're loading some data from our uh, CSV file, which would be asset returns. We're calling the PCA strategy and then only using this one function right here. So get signals. This does everything. So starting from return standardization, correlation matrix, all this, all this, it does that and it returns you with signals. So what the signals are is from the moment that we have the eigenvalues, right? At each stock, so say we have 100 stocks, at each time period, we're looking if from the past, say, 60 days, we have a good mean reversion speed for each stock's um, idiosyncratic component. If it's good, we're calculating the S score. And if the S score is deviating in one way or the other, we're opening a respectively buy or uh, sell position. And the get signals merges all these signals. So on one time frame, you can have, for example, one trade being uh, advised by the strategy. And on the other day, on the other day, more stocks are showing, uh, more aristocratic components are showing good mean reversion speeds. And you can get 10, for example, trade signals. So they are all combined. And what you're getting is this frame here with the weights that you should invest in each of the uh, uh, elements in your, um, in your universe. So here, for example, say we have these four stocks. So each day we have the number of the amount that should be invested in each of these stocks. Also, if you would like to go step by step with this algorithm, there is no problem with that. You can call separately standardization data function, getting factor weights, so weights to calculate the eigen portfolios, then actually calculating the factor returns, uh, getting residuals, and residuals here are our idiosyncratic components, and calculating the S score. So if you want to adjust the strategy by your field, you can do that. What do we do with all with this thing? Well, since we're having a trade signal at the end of this day, we should uh, to calculate the um, equity curve of the portfolio that we have here. We should multiply this by stock returns, but shift it one day ahead because today's signal we can use we can only use tomorrow since it, we're using daily close prices in this example. So multiplying these signals by uh, tomorrow's returns of each stock, what we get this in this example. So this is not the original author's results. It's what we just did with a bunch of stocks. I guess we took about 170 
This example is available in research notebook in the arbitrage lab. So if you have access to it, you can check this out. Um, and we're seeing that on this particular example, the equity curve rose from zero to 0 0.11. So over the year of 2019, uh, this strategy generated 11% uh, increase in portfolio value, which is rather nice. Now let's quickly discuss some upsides, downsides, and variations of the strategy. Quick upside. So first, this approach in the original form was trying to avoid data mining because it picked rather a big universe of stocks to pick from. So all the US stocks that are above 1 billion market capitalization. It used same trading wind training window. So the same window for each stock for calculating the uh, correlation metrics and for estimating eigen portfolio. So, yep. And it also was using the same entry and exit as value. So it was using 1.25 to enter and 0 0.5 to exit. It produced really good results from 97 to 2007. And this strategy is proposing many possible adjustments. Now, two few downsides that are there uh, to mention them. First is there is a need to adjust the number of factors that we are using. So authors showed that actually 15 factors works really good. Um, on their data set, using a vary, varying number of factors did not produce better results, so they stick with 15. But you may want to tweak this in your own strategy. The second thing is, remember when we are calculating the correlation metrics, we're actually having uh, more, in some cases, more entries of uh, in the correlation metrics than the data points that we have originally. So what I mean by that? Imagine you are trading this thing on uh, 500 stocks. So S&P 500, for example, you have 500 stocks and you're looking back to 152 days, right? So you have a matrix of 500 by 250 roughly. And the result that you're getting here is a correlation matrix of 500 by 500. So you're actually getting more data points in the end, which is not that good. What are some of the variations that were either proposed by the authors and actually tested there or proposed by other uh, scientists? So A, you can use variable number of PCA factors. In this example, we're showing 15 factors. You can use a varying number depending on the number of factors that are explaining uh, above 50% of stocks variance. It's your like an option for you to do. Next, you can use volume data to adjust returns. Um, authors in the paper uh, explain how the volume data can be used to omit some of the false trading signals, uh, adjusting to actually trade day length using the volume um, daily volumes. So I encourage you to have a look at that as well. But for them, it didn't as far as I remember, give better results for the PCA uh, strategy. Um, then there is an option of modifying the S score to take drift into account. So if you remember on this complicated math slide where we had the ornstein ullenbeck process, we have the alpha parameter, which is the drift. So we are assumed it's, state, uh, it's constant, but you actually also can assume that it's changing at some pace. There is a mathematical background in the author's paper of how this can be modeled, but also, when they're modeling it, they didn't get better results than assuming that it's uh, constant. So uh, just telling you that. Another thing that you can use can be using ETFs as factors instead of PCA eigen portfolios. So we have the PCA eigen portfolios, as you remember, we calculated them. Instead of them, you can actually use ETFs, sector ETFs, to have the same number of factors. And there are strategies. So the strategy is staying the same, but it's no longer a PCA approach in that case. You can look at the original paper. The results of the factor ETF strategy was not as good as um, PCA strategy. As far as I remember, it's sharp over the same period was about 1.11 in comparison to 1.44 here. Um, but yeah, that's an option. Uh, a solution that was proposed uh, in the paper by Krauss, and these two are actually from that paper, is a using a asymptotic PCA. So as I, I said here, we are having more data entries in the uh, correlation metrics than in the original metrics in some cases. 
So using asymptotic PCA you may help with that thing. Uh, also, we can like since we are assuming that the um, idiosyncratic components are stationary. Hey, why not also add a stationarity test for the residuals? So the idiosyncratic components. We can try to do that. Here is a list of references. Um, if you would like to get a deeper understanding of the concept or just broaden your view on uh, statistical arbitrary fair trading. So first paper here is by Kraus, uh, and this is the paper that we were using when building the arbitrage lab. I highly encourage you to have a look at it because you'll get a really good review and understanding of what pair trading strategies are there. And you'll also get a better understanding of what we're proposing to you with the arbitrage lab package. Um, the second is actually the paper by Avalanada and Lee that we covered today in today's presentation and that is implemented there in the PCA strategy. Uh, two last papers by Cummins and uh, Montana are providing or they have some ideas to adjust the um, PCA approach that you're seeing here. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you like the presentation and uh, please also encourage you to watch, watch our presentations that are on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to discuss something regarding this presentation or just uh, talk about some professional stuff, here are links to my social media. Also, you can follow us as Hudson Temps on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, not to miss our future events. And thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.